sometimes everything just falls into place making a video and it's just done like that. And sometimes it don't. And I have struggled to make a video on this 1903 A3. And a lot of the problem is, this is getting into stuff that I barely understand myself. History, values, why we value what we do, what's important, that type of stuff. And this rifle gets into all of that. The 1903, that's an important part of hunting history. But us hunters don't value the history of hunting rifles. Most of us don't. We're only looking at what's the latest and greatest feature. I see it, but like our phones, what's the latest version? We couldn't care less about the old obsolete versions. Same way on rifles, we don't want the old obsolete versions. But here's the thing, our phones and software and all that good stuff, that's for the virtual world. This is in the real world. And in the real world, there's certain fundamentals, principles, laws of physics, metalworking, woodworking, um, even working with synthetics. There's those fundamentals, those basics, they don't change. Laws of physics don't change. The ballistics on a cartridge a hundred years ago, the same laws govern that cartridge as it does today. Because laws of physics don't change, so ballistics don't change metalworking, engineering, all of that stuff. It's, this is eternal. Okay, so if a rifle worked 100 years ago, it still works. If a rifle didn't work 100 years ago, it still doesn't work. <laughs> this hasn't changed, the fundamentals. And that's why it gets so complicated with hunting rifles is we have such a hard time separating the real world from the virtual world now. I mean, how many of you, your, your entire concept of a rifle is based on, you know, what you saw in a movie with that rifle or a video game, or you read about it or watched on, on a YouTube video. <laughs> That's the virtual world. In the real world, those you know, things don't change. And as a result, I'm having a hard time explaining all this. You know, I'm barely grasping it myself. So we just kind of reached the point that I have wasted so much time trying to explain it that I just got to just shut my mouth and put my head down and go to work. And that's what we're fixing to do here. <laughs> we're fixing to set up two rifles. We're going to set up this 1903A3. And the reason I wanted to do the video to start with and explaining parts of the history of, and so forth is because there are certain things on this rifle I really value and whoever sporterized this rifle knew some things. They understood those principles, those timeless basics. And I can see it in their woodworking skills and I can see it in the things they did. But it's not a pretty rifle. But it sure is a functional one, and this is a fine a hunting rifle as you could ever go into the field with. This rifle will get it done every time, and we'll do it for however long you maintain it. And that's, I wanted to do the video explaining some of those features and why I valued this rifle as much as I do, why I bought this rifle, because I was impressed with those things. But again, it's, we're just going to have to go to work now. And what we're doing, we're going to set up this 1903 and we're going to set up this FN. We're going to refinish the stocks. We're going to do some bedding where needed. We're going to see just how good a rifle we can turn these into compared to a modern rifle. So these old obsolete whatevers. How can they stand up to a modern rifle once we get done doing everything we're going to do? And right now we're fixing to tear them down and see what we need and then go from there. So let's just start with the FN and break it down and see where we're at and what we've got. I 
on this FM, we've got a cross brace in here to prevent splitting, just the way they made this stock. And that cross brace, the recoil lug's already going to set flush against it. And at the rear of the action, we've got a steel insert inside the action here, similar to a lot of the old military rifles. But it's not going to be very consistent as far as how it sits in here. So I think we are going to bed this. And I had talked about just bedding the length of the barrel on this particular rifle. But I'm, I'm changing my mind on that. I, I think we're going to free float this one. And the reason I'm saying that is because at the range when I did shoot this with the scope, my shots were stringing to the right. So that tells me the barrel's contacting the wood on the left as it expands, as it heats up, is pushing the barrel to the right, is changing the point of impact. Free floating the barrel will change that. Which bedding it might, it would at least make it more consistent, but I know free floating the barrel will eliminate that and I think that'll really reduce our shot groups. And if I want to go back later on and add bedding to the stock so that you know the whole thing's bedded, I can do that. And part of my thinking behind that also was this is such a thin barrel and they didn't have the heat treating processes in the past that they do now. So these thin barrels, they had a little more stress in them than what you'll see in a thin barrel now. As a result, when these barrels warm up, just because of the stresses in them, just them heating up can cause some inaccuracy, some accuracy problems. So what they used to do on thin barrels was they would bed the entire stock where the barrel contacted. And they're thinking them was that would improve your accuracy and help settle these barrels down. It'd give them more support. Well, they kind of knew what they were doing then. If they did that, they did it for a reason. And if you go back to the Winchester Featherweights when they came back out with them in 1980, 81, somewhere in there, those rifles, the stocks were bedded all the way down the barrel in thin barrels, and that's the thinking then. But for right now, we're going to free float the barrel. We'll see what kind of accuracy we get. And if we need to go back later on, that'll be simple enough. And everything else on this stock looks pretty good. And my thinking is go ahead and, and bed everything now. Then we go back and we refinish the stocks. That way, you know, I don't have to worry about dinging anything up while I'm doing the bedding or anything. I want to worry about marring the, you know, the finish, that type of stuff. I want to worry about getting bedding compound anywhere. So I, I think that's going to be our plan there. And this barrel having so many contours to it, I could see that being a real challenge when I do go to sand out and remove some wood in the stock here to free float it, where those contours are. That, that could be a little challenging for me. It's not just like a standard taper. That'd be interesting. We'll, we'll have to figure that one out. And one other thing I see, this cross brace running through here with the cross bolts, they have two little holes in the end, and I can see that just being really challenging to break these bolts loose and taking them out. I'm going to need to find a special tool for that. And I'm guessing there aren't a lot of those tools just floating around out there. <laughs> so Now let's look at this A303 because I'm curious on this one. I, I know we've got some contact between the stock and the barrel. It's not completely free floated. And I'm not really sure what all else is going on inside of this rifle other than that. A lot of metals in there tight on this one. Yeah, 
interesting just how similar these are, which I don't know if I talked about it, but the reason I wanted to do both of these rifles at the same time, the FN Supreme, the commercial M98 Mauser action, and the 1903A3. The 1903 Springfield was a copy of the M98 Mauser. I mean, I don't mean, you know, it was inspired by, I mean, it's a straight up copy with just a few little alterations. <laughs> so, these two actions, even though these particular rifles were made decades after the originals, the originals are, they're linked. You might as well say they're siblings with the M98 being the older brother of the Springfield. So there is a, a strong connection between these two and it, for me it just seemed fitting to do both of them at the same time. And when you pull the actions out of the stock, you can just really appreciate just how similar they are. Okay, for the 1903A3, pretty much what I thought, there's no bedding. There is a steel insert through the stock, and it looks like it might be bedded right at the top of it. That's interesting. I'm not sure that there's really anything we need to do to this one at the rear. But the front, it can definitely use some bedding. Looks like we've got an 88 inscribed into the stock here, impressed in it. Okay. And we've got the channels for clearance on this 03 stock which not clearance but to lighten them up and these were this is a fairly light rifle a lot lighter than what you would expect it would hold up well by modern standards as far as weight this isn't overly heavy and that's because they removed wood from the stocks but this is where I'm hitting at when I check the barrel to see if it's free floating. I always caught one spot in the middle now. Okay, that's why. This one should just be fairly straightforward though. I'm not... We've even got the same cross bolt going through here. We've got a split nut on there. I think I've got a screwdriver for that that I can use to get that out. That might be fun breaking that loose. All right, not much left to do here then, but to, to get started and get it done. It looks like one pin holding in the trigger. This is a two-stage trigger, which I know a lot of you don't care for two-stage triggers, but I absolutely love a two-stage trigger for a hunting rifle in the field. At the bench, one stage, way to go. In the field, unsupported positions, I love a two-stage. And that is as simple and reliable of a trigger as you could ever ask for. All right, let me get to work. I've roughed up the surfaces in my stock, used the Dremel tool, on the places where I want the bedding, that way the compound can adhere real well to the wood. So you don't want to try and make it stick to flat, smooth surfaces. But one of the interesting things we're going to run into with this being, a, both being M98 Mausers essentially, even the 1903, and this issue's on both of them because they're pretty much the same action. On the recoil lug for the both of them, we have a blind hole. So I can't just run a screw through here 
and run the bedding compound up into the, you know, this hole or the plumber's putty that I'm going to use to seal off the surfaces. Plus, with an M98, on both stocks, there's a metal insert, a metal pillar, you might say, for the tank. And then you see how the front fits here. Okay, well, that's kind of an issue because, again, I can't just have the compound running up into this blind hole where the action screw goes because the action screw on the M98 goes directly into the recess, into the recoil block. Plus on the stocks, there's a rather large hole for the bottom metal for that bolster to fit up into. So I'm going to have to get creative here where it amounts to. And I think what we're going to do is take some plumber's putty. We're going to fill in the hole here. Then we're going to create a pretty good size hole through there so that essentially it serves as a dam to keep the bedding compound you know, out of the way. And then hopefully the plumber's putty can just spread out to the side and we'll have you know, plenty of clearance there without having to worry about the bedding compound. So yeah, that's one of the challenges with these M98s. But if we get it right, it's gonna turn out pretty good. And the whole time we're gonna have to monitor the magazine weld to make sure that we're, we're still getting a good fit within the action. So yeah, we, we've got a lot to keep an eye on here, but right now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna put some clear shoe polish, which that's gonna be our release agent on the bottom metal for both actions. We're gonna use plumber's putty to seal up all the holes and little crevices where we don't want the bedding compound. And then we're going to fill in these holes and hopefully it works. Now with all that out of the way, we've got plumber's putty in all the recesses. We've got clear shoe polish for our release agent. It's everywhere. We've got uh, recoil lugs taped up and that was an adventure taping up these recoil lugs with that threaded hole in there. And I was mistaken earlier. I said it was a blind hole. It's a through hole, but the barrel threads are on the other side. So there's no getting it to it. And again, we don't want anything going through there like epoxy. So yeah, it's kind of making it a little bit challenging. And we're going to have to be careful around, you know, everywhere for the magazine well. It's, just got to see what happens. But I think we're going to be okay. We'll find out soon enough. And one thing I learned with so many of the factory rifles now being bedded from the factory, it's just how little epoxy you actually need. So that's gonna help this whole process out right, right there, just knowing we don't need a lot. Okay, so hopefully that'll prevent it from getting everywhere. And I taped up the stocks. Yeah, I could have been, you know, taped it up a lot more than I did. But we're fixing to refinish the stocks. So I'm not that worried about them. And on the case of 
the 1903 I didn't tape up around the tang for the action but that's because it is deep on this rifle so I think we're okay here now let's we're using Brownells Acro Glass I've never used it and let's face it if you're gonna bed rifles you got to try it at least once just to say you did so we're gonna use it twice and see what happens and it's a uh, two-part epoxy, you mix it in equal parts. Again, this isn't going to take much. Man, I think both of them are pretty much ready to go here. for the moment of truth. Just make sure we put the right barrel in action in the right stock. <laughs> okay, yes, we have the F in. And I would love to have a vice set up for this, but this is what we got. There's nothing to do now but wait. And I'm going to end the video right here and let y'all wait with me. <laughs> That's right. I want y'all to feel the anticipation I'm feeling. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> I, I'm just going to clean up my mess. I'll come back in four hours after things are set up a little bit. I'll break the action screws loose just to make sure you know we're good there. And tomorrow evening I'll come out here and pull everything apart and don't worry I'll show y'all how they turned out so if you got anything out of this video at all please give it a thumbs up let YouTube know you like hunting and shooting videos and it helps out the video and if you want to see how this turns out make sure you hit the subscribe button and notification bell God bless and have a good evening